Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are around, from around the world. Um, my name is uh, Ravi Mamtani. I'm a professor and vice dean at the Institute for Population Health um, at Wild Cornell Medicine in Qatar. And uh, we are delighted to have you with us this evening and, um, and um, to our Population Health and Wellbeing series. A reminder that the series, the objectives of the series are threefold. One, discuss contemporary and critical topics relevant to healthcare, medicine, and population health. Examine evidence-based practices germane to public health and patient care. Uh, and finally, describe opportunities and challenges in the evolving face of healthcare and population health. And um, we are really delighted to have you with us. Um, So a couple of housekeeping notes before we proceed. <clears throat> Your cameras and microphones are turned off. Uh, please use the Q&A feature to type questions and comments that you might have. Um, and needless to say that we will address the questions uh, at the end of the session. Uh, <clears throat> and again, as a reminder, many of you have are familiar with our series. Uh, we are accredited and this seminar is accredited by the uh, ACCME of the US, as well as also um, has the designation approval of the Qatar government. And it's approved for a maximum of one hour of CME. Um, so <clears throat> insofar as evaluation and certificates are concerned, the post-activity evaluation will be available in your cloud CME account by November 9, 2023. Uh, you will receive an email notification once the evaluation is available in your cloud CME account. And finally, that your certificates will be available for download once you complete the post-activity evaluation on the cloud CME uh, portal. So <clears throat> we are absolutely very delighted uh, once again to welcome you and equally delighted to have an esteemed world-renowned scientist uh, from Cornell University to spend some time with us on what I think is a fantastic topic, specifically precision nutrition for population health. Um, just to maybe give you a little um, outline um, in terms of uh, our speaker's uh, uh, background. Um, of course, he is our guest. His name is Saurabh Mehta, M MD, uh, um, Doctor of Science. Dr. Mehta is a physician with training and expertise in nutrition, epidemiology, infectious diseases, and diagnostics. He's currently the Janet and Gordon Langton Professor in the Division of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell University and served on its executive leadership team. He's also the founding director of the Cornell Center for Physician Nutrition and Health and co-director of the NIH-funded Center for Point of Care Diagnostics for Nutrition, Infection, and, and cancer. Dr. Mehta is the program director of the NIH supported training program on artificial intelligence and precision nutrition. Um, he also co leads the research coordinating center for the NIH's Nutrition for Precision Health Initiative and directs the program in international nutrition at Cornell. Um, the central theme of the research, his, his central theme of the Research is the interplay between nutrition and disease, including facilitating field-friendly assessment for both and elucidating how nutrition can be used as a modifiable factor to improve health and associated outcomes. Um, Dr. Mehta has worked extensively and has spent a lot of time working in the US um, and also uh, in India, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America. Um, Dr. Mehta received his training at a prestigious medical school uh, in New Delhi, India, and then followed up uh, with doctoral degree in epidemiology and nutrition from Harvard. Um, needless to say, he has been a recipient of many, many prestigious awards. So Dr. Mehta, I won't go any further. I could spend another maybe a few minutes, but why don't we leave it here and have the audience listen to your wisdom and the fantastic work that you've done. 
So we are grateful to you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us. And uh, with that, over to you, Dr. Mehta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mamtani. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words and uh, introduction. And uh, thank you also for the invitation. I really, really appreciate it. Um, hi, everyone. Um, maybe I can start with sharing my screen. All right. Let's hit play. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. All right. Uh, so I will start with the outline of my talk today is uh, I have the disclosure, then talk a little bit about what is precision nutrition, why do we need it, and then give some examples of work in this space, uh, some from our work, some from consortia that I'm a part of, um, and then talk a little bit about this new center that we have at Cornell called Center for Precision Nutrition and Health, uh, where hopefully there are opportunities for us to do uh, synergistic work as well as uh, potential collaborative opportunities. Uh, this is my NIH standard disclosure, uh, my research funding, and um, and also um, the main corporate interest that I have is that uh, I'm on the board of directors of Wider Scan and hold equity in it. Uh, it's a company that is trying to commercialize some of the technologies that have partly been developed in my lab around point of care diagnostics. Um, this is the CME disclosure. Um, as I said, I have an ownership interest in Wider Scan. I would not be discussing any unlabeled and unapproved use of drugs or products. Um, the learning objectives are uh, really give a pro introduction to why precision nutrition, what's the difference between precision nutrition and population nutrition, and what where the synergies are or where the overlap is. Um, and uh, typically, when we think about population nutrition, we are thinking about one size fits all approach. But how do we adapt that given that we are not the same size or same people across the board? Um, then identify research gaps and needs for implementing and scaling up some of these approaches, and maybe give a moment to reflect on you know how how everyone can think about use this kind of a lens to apply to their work. Why do we care? Um, if we look at the global burden of disease data, this is uh, on the right the graphic from Lancet in 2021. Um, I think it will be obvious to everyone that poor nutrition is a leading cause of disease, reduced quality of life, healthcare spending, loss productivity. So if you look on the right, the leading risks are include high systolic blood pressure, plasma glucose, low birth weight, high body mass index, a high LDL cholesterol, um, child wasting, child underweight. I would say all of them fall in the nutrition space or are majorly contributed to by nutrition or poor nutrition. Uh, the uh, recent global nutrition report estimated that a third of premature deaths around the world are attributable to poor nutrition. So we are really talking about the same kind of magnitude as smoking in a way, or when smoking, um, the argument with smoking and all the laws and everything else, all the public health action against smoking was a fair amount of that was based on premature mortality. So when we think about dietary guidance, and I'm, uh, you know, diet is such an integral part of our life, so I'm sure everyone thinks about food and diet uh, to a certain extent. Uh, what we have are things like universal population recommendations, such as a recommended dietary allowance or a dietary reference intake, um, such as large-scale food fortification. So this is often based on population surveillance to define burden. An example would be mandatory folate fortification of uh, flour in the US, for example, that happened about 30 years ago. It was largely based on the observed incidence of birth defects. And it was clear that having higher folate preconceptionally or before the pregnancy stage would lead to reduction in birth defects. So the best strategy at that time that was considered was that let's do a population level implementation. So a mandatory fortification was put in place. So by law, uh, folate had to be added to all flower products. And that led to a substantial decline in birth defects and neural tube defects, particularly in this country. Uh, the other example is prevent preventative. You can target certain population subsets at higher risk. And so that can be done both at the population and the clinical level. And then there is therapeutic. And this is largely clinical. So you observe a patient comes into the clinic, you observe a deficit and you treat it. 
Um, so th that's that's typically where diet or dietary guidance. So you know, therapeutic will be something like okay, a patient with cardiovascular elevated cardiovascular risk comes in, or patient with elevated HbA1c or diabetes risk comes in, and then we one of the first things clinicians will recommend is diet and lifestyle modifications. So that those are examples of these programs. Um, now these are limited because recommendation is based on population data. When you examine the evidence base for a lot of that population data, it comes from healthy populations. We all recognize that the vast majority of the world is not healthy at any given point of time. In the US, for example, 40 to 60 percent of people are suffering from some kind of a chronic disease. And so do those recommendations apply to people with disease or people with other needs or other physiological demands? The conventional nutrition recommendations are based often on minimizing the risk of single nutritional deficiencies. So they, by default, use a one-size-fits-all solution. So if you indulge me on a tangent, if you think about nutrition, nutrition as a formal Western academic discipline is probably about 100 years old. And where we started, and of course I'm oversimplifying, um, where we started was that, okay, there are certain vitamins, certain minerals that cause certain deficiency diseases. So now we need to prevent them. And so that's an extreme. So when we think about nutrition, say, let's say the example of vitamin D, we are talking about vitamin D causes rickets in children and osteomalacia in adults if it's deficient. But now we took it forward and said that, okay, there are certain physiological groups that might need more. So initially the recommended dietary lances were established that let's find a dose that is safe and that will eliminate the deficiency in 97.5 percent of the population so left one tail out right so that's how the rds are uh the if you pick up a vitamin bottle or something like that when it says what your daily doses dose is that's basically what it means that that recommended dietary allowance is going to if everyone in the population consumes it you won't see the deficiency disease in 97.5 percent of the population and um, so, A, it was based on only eliminating that nutrient deficiency. B, it also then ignores, when you think about it, that it ignores that nutrition is so integral to our body in multiple, multiple tissues and has multiple functions beyond just the deficiency disorder. So continuing with the example of vitamin D, vitamin D, of course, the, convent, the classical role is in calcium absorption. But if you think about beyond calcium absorption, vitamin D receptor is present on 600 body tissues. What is it doing there? It's doing multiple things. It's improve, It's modulating the immune function. It might have anti-cancer properties. It might have other things. It's not magical. It's not a magic bullet. Let me clarify that. It doesn't substitute for other treatments, but it might have a role within a constellation of other things to help improve quality of life and improve function. So that when you think about that, that everyone might need different doses of vitamin D, but beyond that, there might be a different dose of vitamin D needed for optimizing different levels of function. So we have figured out the deficiency piece, but that's what the population level or the conventional nutrition recommendations have done. But we haven't really gone beyond that stage. At some point we figured out, okay, certain groups need more. So pregnancy, elderly, children. So we went away from one size fits all to, okay, certain physiological groups need a little bit more. Now we are at a stage where we are like, okay, now there is more customization needs to be done because the food environment or the nutrition or health environment that we are living in has many more components. It's, it has many things, like, many things affected, our physical activity, our food behaviors, our dietary habits, our, gen uh, our genetic makeup, microbiome, metabolomics, and so on. So there are so many things that affect our nutrition and consequently our health, that there is a need for movements towards precision nutrition. If I have to boil it down, the idea is the problem is heterogeneous in its etiology or its causation, in its biology, the way it's distributed in the population, and also in potential solutions. So really the bottom line is that one size fits all approaches don't work. So the National Institutes of Health, which is the uh, main funding body and um, agenda setting body in the US for health research, they came up with a strategic plan for nutrition research in for 2020 to 2030, this decade, and they made the focus to be precision nutrition. 
The way they define it is that it's a unifying and holistic framework to develop comprehensive and dynamic nutritional recommendations. It's not like it's one time set for life kind of a thing. It's dynamic because we change, we move, we migrate, our environments change, and so on and so forth. It includes considerations for genetics, dietary habits, eating patterns, circadian rhythms, health status, socioeconomic and psychosocial characteristics, food environments, physical activity, and the microbiome. So this became the centerpiece of NIH's um, uh, strategic plan for nutrition research. And as part of that, they ended up funding the largest nutrition study that they have ever funded. Um, I think this is the largest one, I might be wrong, but one of the largest. Uh, they put in about $170 million for uh, studying precision nutrition. And the objectives of the study are that they, we want to figure out individual differences observed in response to different diets by studying the interaction between diet, genes, proteins, microbiome, metabolism, and other things that make us up. And then to use artificial intelligence to develop algorithms to predict individual responses to foods and dietary patterns, and then to validate the, those algorithms. So as you can see, that the data that we are now getting is so complex and so multimodal. Multimodal and complex in the sense that A, we are getting data from multiple sources. It's not traditional data collection forms and stuff, that, which is very important, but now we are also getting data from all kinds of other sources. And then the data, so it's in different formats. And then data is also coming from multiple disciplines. So in traditional epidemiological research, we have often focused on exposure and disease, and then always have this kind of a, either a cloud up above our causal framework or causal figure or some kind of a box saying there is unmeasured confounding or residual confounding that might be climate and so on and so forth. Two things have changed. One, we do have that data now. We can collect that data. B, we now have the tools to analyze that data and account for some of that. So that's where the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning comes in. So what NIH did was they established um, piggybacking on the All of Us initiative, which is the Precision Medicine Initiative, which is enrolling a million people in the U.S. to figure out, um, a, to establish basically a baseline uh, for population health. Um, piggybacking on that, the Nutritional Precision Health Study was established. And as part of that, there are six clinical centers all over the country. There are data generation centers, one which will do only metabolomics and clinical assays, one that will do microbiome and metagenomics, one that will figure out novel assessment for uh, novel methods for dietary assessment. And then there are two artificial intelligence centers that will help us handle all the complex data that will be coming out of this. And then uh, there is a biobank at Mayo Clinic and then the research coordinating center, which is in the middle of all of this, coordinating all of these activities, which I co-lead with colleagues at RTI International. So what, what are we doing as part of this study? This started about a year ago. Um, what we are doing as part of this study is there are three modules. The first module is observational. What we are doing is recruiting 10,000 people and following them up for about 10 days. It, after the enrollment, we assess for 10 days their diet. We have a continuous glucose monitor. We have physical activity assessments, heart rate, heart rate variability. We, and then at the end of 10 days, we give them a liquid meal tolerance test and try to identify their metabolic response. So we collect their blood at nine time points, urine, saliva, stool, hair, nails, and there are gonna be multiple other tests that are gonna be done. It boils down to that we'll do complete phenotyping as far as we can in these 10,000 participants. So you can imagine the kind of complex and the amount of data that will be generated from this. Module two is community dwelling crossover study. So there are three test diets that people will be randomized to. Everyone will take those three diets, but they, the order will be different. And so the diet will last for about two weeks, 14 days, and then there'll be a washout period, and then another two weeks, another two weeks. and. For those two weeks, we'll again measure a lot of these things. And um, now we are really trying to assess that are there particular diets or components of diets that might be better than others. The module three is the same thing, but it's gonna be in a residential unit at the clinical centers. And so everything will be supervised. So the meals will be supervised, the weight diet records will be collected and so on. So that's, that's the 
set up, you can think of module one as an observational or a cross-sectional study in a way. Module two and three, you can think of them as efficacy and effectiveness studies to use some of the classical FE language here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is now, we have recruited about five to 10% of the target population. Uh, stay tuned, we'll have more results on this in about a year or two. And, uh, um, and but this will, this will really be the resource or a go-to for a lot of uh, nutrition information. So um, that's, that's the nutrition for precision health study. I will shift gears here and then talk about uh, the fo uh, what I'm gonna focus a little bit on this talk is one element of my research program, which is how can we use advances in modern technology to enable or support the mission and vision of precision nutrition. Um, there are two things that we are targeting. One is data and one is diagnostic tools. Uh, on the data side, we are trying to establish better ways of collecting data, curating data, analyzing it, and synthesizing that evidence, and then also communicating it in a way to enable translation, whether it's to end users, consumers, policymakers, and so on. Then on the diagnostic tool sides, those are definitely needed because we, uh, at least in my opinion, because how do you target and monitor people? So if you're going to say that somebody needs to consume a personalized diet, how do we monitor the response in a convenient manner? Or how do we identify people who need different kinds of diet or different nutrients? So I'm gonna give an example of the Nutrifone. This is a project that we started working on about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, in collaboration with David Erickson, who's the director of uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering here at Cornell. Um, for us, the main issue was that access to affordable and reliable nutritional status testing remains sparse. There's a big diagnostic gap. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the Lancet Commission on Diagnostics, which a couple of years ago put out a special issue saying that about 50% of the world's population don't have access to basic primary care diagnostics. And when they define primary care, you will notice very quickly that nutrition is not even a part of it. Anemia or iron deficiency, for example, is not even a part of that because the capacity for that is even more limited. So that was kind of our motivation that how do we how do we provide affordable, reliable nutrition status at the population level? How do we enable this to be, how do, how do we enable precision nutrition by providing this resource, especially at the population level? Um, and so our question was, can point of care devices, especially coupled with smartphones and explosion in pocket computers that we have, uh, can that help? And what we wanted to do was, we had some ground rules we wanted it to be sensitive or specific enough to meet the screening or diagnostic criteria uh, or diagnostic test criteria, need only a minimal sample, like a drop of blood or a drop of sample, minimal infrastructure, minimal training, minimal cost. And we saw it as extending the reach of traditional laboratories because even in big places, when you think about uh, nutritional testing, there are very few labs that are capable of doing comprehensive nutritional tests. Um, so we initially started with uh, some of the nutrition work. We were lucky enough to get funding from National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health back in 2013 um, that got us started on this path. Um, I don't really need to uh, explain these tests anymore to anyone because uh, I think everyone is familiar with the COVID-19 rapid test. It's a very similar test um, and uh, it's based on the lateral flow immunoassay where you take a finger stick of blood or you take a drop of blood, put it on a test strip. The test reaction takes 10 minutes, and then there are multiple ways of reading it. Uh, our innovations here are, because we have three issued patents in this space, our major innovations are how to minimize the sample prep. And then the biggest, from a translation point, at least in my opinion, is how do we quantify that signal? How do we uh, take a test control line and basically a test and control line, take the ratio, and then figure out what the concentration in the sample is. So that that really has been our, um, um, what we have done, we have done it for multiple, multiple analytes. So you can see we have applied the same technology to multiple nutrients, a lot of food safety work, a lot of inflammation work, alpha AGP, C reactor protein. Uh, we have increasingly moved into cancer. Uh, we have a project on prostate specific antigen screening, especially among uh, African-American populations in the US that's going on right now in New York, and then also a lot of work on infectious diseases, particularly in low and middle income settings. 
uh, the testing protocol is very similar. So it's like if it's a child, we are doing a heel prick. Um, and the, because we are doing it based linked to a smartphone or a mobile device, there are additional capabilities of integrating with the health record or uploading it to say central uh, notification databases and so on. Uh, it's accompanied by a mobile app, which guides you step-by-step step on what can be done. Uh, this is what it looks like. This is for the uh, alpha fetoprotein test that we recently did uh, and published on. Um, that's what the test strip looks like. The reader is sitting at the bottom here. It's a, it's a commercial reader. So we have worked on um, multiple different formats where we have made our own readers. We have made uh, things that uh, attach to a smartphone but then we have also made it compatible with third party readers like a cube reader uh, so that it can be easily scaled up and implemented in different settings around the world. Uh, these are just some of our publications looking, this is specifically looking at iron deficiency. Um, if uh, iron deficiency is typically measured by quantifying ferritin in blood and also complemented by soluble transfer and receptor. Um, our, these are just key metrics like our correlation is above 0.9 the sensitivity and specificity are about 90%. So they meet some of the WHO criteria for, um, for um, diagnostic as well as screening tests. Uh, we have also done some multiplexing. This is just an example. It's a paper about six years ago now, BNAS, looking at uh, how we can multiply plex iron, vitamin A, and inflammation on the same, same single test strip. We are also working on expanding it to different sources. So can we work with serum, saliva, urine? Yes, a similar technology works across all of them. Um, and uh, we actually got an NIH uh, prize, a technology accelerator challenge prize for uh, our concept of using saliva for uh, measuring inflammation and iron status at the same time. And this is work that's ongoing in my lab right now. We also recently, this just came out last week, we have also used the same technology to add it because our vision is that we want some of this technology to be across the entire food supply or food value chain or the food system. So we also have uh, expanded it to look at food safety markers. Can we use uh, can we use the same technology to, for example, look at aflatoxin, aflatoxin both at storage, at point of use, point of distribution, point of consumption, and so on. Uh, so this is just a big picture that at the population level, um, like for example, in a demographic health survey, we can use some of this technology to uh, to uh, measure nutritional status and uh, and identify what the nutritional needs might be. And the same thing at the individual level, we can tailor these recommendations by somebody monitoring their status, monitoring their diet. Also, they can. Uh, potentially use some of these tests or, you know, not necessarily from our lab. There are other labs also working on this, um, on assessing nutrient composition and quality at the same time to make sure that what we are consuming actually meets our standards. Uh, this is just a snapshot. This is where the development, asset development pipeline is. So I'm not going to talk about the industry side of things. The academia is on the top. Uh, in the, and if you see the labels and on the academic side, what we do is biomarker identification, feasibility testing, development, and lab validation. But then the diagnostic test accuracy and the regulatory work, if somebody's interested, they license those technologies and take it out of the academic setting. So you can see all the nutrition markers that we have worked on. Uh, the fever phone was an NS NIH R01 grant a few years ago, where we have worked on dengue, chikungunya, chagas, leptospirosis, malaria, and so on. Uh, safe phone is uh, what we call the uh, smartphone-based aflatoxin and fumonisin exam system. And uh, so that's food samples. I just shared that with you. Uh, Tiny is our nucleic acid amplification testing platform. And uh, that's largely led by David. And uh, it has worked on Kaposi sarcoma. We also have work on TB and CMV uh, that is in the pipeline. Um, we, just got, uh, we just got a new center grant from NIH on point of care technologies for global health. And what this center is gonna enable us to do is really identify the best technologies from around the world that can address gaps in nutrition, infection, and cancer, and 
accelerate them through the center, provide them funding, provide them support for clinical validation and so on. So if you all, anyone in the audience knows of these, uh, knows of any of these technologies or works on some of these technologies, you will be able to apply to this center. We will be able to, we will be able to, for the successful ones, uh, about six to 10 in a given year, we will be able to support them for $5,200,000 as well as provide an ecosystem of our uh, validation sites across the world on four continents. So that's uh, keep an eye out for the solicitation that shall be coming out early next year uh, if somebody's interested in this area of work. Um, now I'll change gears and maybe talk a little bit, a little bit about the new center that we have uh, at Cornell to identify some of these research gaps. Uh, this is called the Center for Precision Nutrition and Health. And the key questions that we are trying to address here are, how does what we eat, when we eat, and how we eat promote health across our lives? What recommendations can we make for an individual and for a population? How do, where do they intersect? What technologies can we develop to support optimal health and precision nutrition across the lifespan? And how can we make them accessible to the global population? How do we transfer them to industry? Because when we think about you know, advances in technology, they can often go two ways. For example, in 1980, early 1980s, when the MRI or the CT scan was invented, yes, it immediately changed the standard of care, but who could access it? Not everyone could afford a CT scan or an MRI at that point. So it immediately created two classes, that people who were relying on, say, x-rays and people who were relying on uh, CT scan and MRI for healthcare. And that, that is a big disparity that we created. So often advances in modern technology initially create a big disparity in healthcare. So how do we use these advances to actually narrow those disparities rather than widen them? And that's kind of the underlying mission of our center. And how do we train the next generation of scientists, which is of course really the, one of the pivotal things uh, to address some of these challenges. So we have three hubs as part of this center. Uh, one is an AI and technology hub, an evidence synthesis hub, and then a training and external partnership hub. And I'll give you some examples of what we are doing as part of this. Uh, but uh, as I said, the vision here really is that how do we go the last mile? We do a lot of work in the academic side. We publish these papers, we put them on our shelves and everything else, or you know, what, whatever the digital version of that nowadays is. But how do we take that to actually make an impact? How do we take these evidence or technology or any work that we are doing and make a difference in people's lives today? Of course, it's a very lofty and aspirational statement, but that's really the motivating piece here that can, can we do something about it? And so some examples here of this center was only established last year, so it's only been about a year. So some examples here, for example, our AI and technology hub. One of the things that um, we are doing is participating in the NIH Bond Kids project, which is really a global program to identify what are the biomarkers of nutrition and development in children so that school feeding programs can actually uh, monitor these and uh, monitor their own success and, and uh, uh, be, uh, be sustainable so that they can continue to get funding and so on and so forth. Because school feeding programs, it's harder. Uh, when you think about under five, people often think about growth, morbidity, mortality as metrics. But when you're thinking about school feeding programs and you think about the five to 19 age group, you're not necessarily thinking about those metrics to measure success. So that's kind of what we did to complement some of the work there is we created a searchable dashboard, which is available online. Here, the link is up here on the slide. Uh, and then we also added a, a, you know, a chat GPT kind of a chatbot. This is a pilot one. Uh, so please, there'll be a lot of mistakes there, as we all know, but what we are trying to minimize is uh, that it doesn't hallucinate too much, as we know that um, uh, some of these generative AI technologies do, and uh, it's only relying on the information in the dashboard. So it's not relying on information in the web, but you can ask questions like, how do you measure linear growth? The idea is really to make this information accessible to anywhere around the world, and uh, whether it's uh, parents, schools, school nurses, school staff, or implementers or Ministry of Health and so on. Uh, similarly, uh, so this is the Bond Kids dashboard. Uh, similarly, we also did a micronutrient retention dashboard. This was work in partnership with Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Um, the idea was that how do we scale up, uh, scale up the adoption and remove barriers for um, 
for things like biofortified crops. So a lot of countries are considering scaling up uh, biofortified crops, which are crops that have been bred to have high levels of micronutrients or certain nutrients. And uh, so for that, we did a series of reviews and I'll come to that in a minute, but this work is gonna be in Nature Food on Thursday. Um, so there'll be, uh, the paper actually will be published on Thursday. And, um, um, but beyond that, what we added was a large language model. So you can drag and drop your own file or you can use our files here and, um, and um, ask questions like, which, which variety of orange sweet potato, potato should I plant that will lead to the highest beta carotene retention after processing, like after cooking? You can ask questions like, what's the best way to cook this so that I get the best micronutrient content? And of course it thinks for a while, but then it gives you an output like this, that um, these are the different varieties. And you can see that some of them really have higher levels of retention of um, beta carotene or total carotenoids and others don't. So that from a consumer standpoint, you can pick which one you want. From a Ministry of Health standpoint, you can pick which one you want and adapt to your own you know, country and scale it up. So just an example, the again, similar thing with Evidence Synthesis Hub. We, we are also a WHO collaborating center here at Cornell. So we do a fair amount of work to support WHO evidence-based guidelines. Currently, what we are working on are supporting the obesity and childhood and adolescence guidelines that are going to come out next year, and also anemia across the lifespan. Um, so this is just an example of some of those reviews. This is the Nature Food paper on the top upper left, which is going to come out uh, in a couple of days. And But we have worked on all the other implementation barriers for scaling up some of these crops. So like bioaccessibility, bioavailability, what's the sensory acceptability, and so on. Um, we have also worked on advocating for food and nutrition. Uh, this is some of um, this is a commentary in Lancet a couple of months ago, talking about how food and focus on malnutrition can really help uh, help supplement and complement efforts for reducing TB and uh, TB's burden. And um, this is just an example of our, we have multiple training partnerships. We also recently got the first NIH training program in artificial intelligence award. And the idea is that how do we train the next generation of scientists to tackle some of these methods? So if I go back to when I was talking about that traditionally our teaching has been, let's focus on the, focus on the exposure and disease, but really now we are focused on this entire web, this whole ecosystem of things. So how do we train people to tackle that because our conventional training can't do that. So we have this new program, which is really a dual mentorship program where you have a mentor from nutrition or health, and then you have a mentor from computational side and you work together to pick up those skill sets. So we have five trainees on this, uh, four PhD students and one postdoc, uh, and we just appointed the first batch last week. Um, I'll skip that. I will just give a shout out to, if people are interested, we have a WHO Cochrane Connell Summer Institute we, where we teach a fair amount of uh, these evidence synthesis techniques that I, some of them that I alluded to. Uh, we started this in 2014. We have trained, we, we keep the class size small, about 25. It's two weeks in the summer. So if people are interested, please feel free to apply. It's a run at cost. So um, there is no added, uh, uh, it's, it's not super expensive. Um, Again, um, I lead the center here and I have three co-directors, Dr. Patricia Cassano, who's the director also of Division of Nutritional Sciences, uh, Dr. Julia Finkelstein, who's the deputy director of the Cochrane Athlete and the WHO center here. And then uh, David Erickson, of course, and I uh, mentioned his and my work over the last 10 years in the slides. Um, this is some of the news uh, that we have, uh, news coverage that we have received recently on some of this stuff, some of these topics. The most recent one as of last week is that our center is also endowed. So we just got a, a big grant to train the next generation of scientists. So this is largely going to focus on training uh, the next generation of scientists in physician nutrition. And, uh, and I will stop there. Um, I will also, if people are interested in international nutrition, we do have a running podcast and an open webinar every week uh, for those who are interested. And uh, and then I will just stop. I have a, um, I have, of course, most of the work that I presented is um, uh, is 
in a big way, thank uh, is in a big way due to my team, some of who are pictured here, and a set of collaborators, and um, and uh, and a big thank you to College of Human Ecology, my home unit, uh, for uh, sharing this vision and investing in it to make some of this work possible. And of course, um, thank you to all the funders who have supported this work. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, let's see if we can stop sharing these slides. Uh, okay. Dr. Mehta, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, that was an amazing discussion. Uh, and the topic of uh, precision nutrition is so timely and attractive. And uh, I think not, I think, in fact, I know that the audience definitely benefited from your, from your wisdom and from your remarks. So thank you so much. A uh, couple of questions. Um, you touched upon the nature of training you may uh, provide to professionals. Uh, you mentioned a specific program, two weeks in the summer. C can you tell us um, first of all, the mechanism for people to, to apply or, or if there are any other opportunities. And I'm thinking of not necessarily people who want to become scientists, if you will, but some people who do day-to-day -day stuff have a lot of interest in nutrition, as I do. Are there any training programs for such individuals as well? So if you can please comment on that, we would be grateful. Right. Uh, so there are, uh, thank you. Thank you so much again. And thank you so much for your kind words, um, Dr. Mantani. One, um, the course that I talked about is more for people who are uh, who want to do systematic reviews and who want to contribute to systematic reviews, learn the process, and then work uh, you know, closely under mentorship with WHO and Cochrane colleagues, because we have faculty from WHO, Cochrane, and Cornell here on campus for that time. So they get to know how the Cochrane system works. They get to know how the WHO guideline process works and how the evidence synthesis happens, how that becomes a guideline and so on. So the, uh, so people who are interested in that, that's a, that's an important course. Then people who are interested in nutrition uh, in general, I think uh, th there are a lot of courses on econal, for example, there are some that we are going to put out on position nutrition at some point. It's not going to be at least for another year. But then yeah. there are also other topics that other partners, for example, have done. Um, and for example, we had worked on this program through Connell Nutrition Works on infant and adolescent feeding. And what's the best ways to do that? And that's freely available online. And uh, um, I have some lectures, but there are a lot of other faculty in there who have lectures in that course. But then some of other nutrition entities, especially in international nutrition, uh, like Nutrition International, for example, UNICEF. UNICEF has a course. Those are all freely available online. So um, that can be, that might be of interest for people. Yeah. But I think the precision nutrition coursework is just beginning to evolve. So I expect that that will, that plate of offerings will, um, will expand over the next year. So uh, talking about that um, as a way of information, Dr. Mehta, we at Cornell in Qatar run a certificate in lifestyle medicine. And as you can imagine, nutrition is a big component of it. Uh, information is very practical. I mean, yours is obviously um, surrounded by finesse and scientific information, but we are straightforward, simple people in <laughs> the way we deliver our program. Uh, of practical utility to a practitioner. And, and at some point, it is my hope that we can visit you, talk to you and your group and others, and we'd be happy to come and share what we do at Cornell in Qatar. But anyway, having made that remark, uh, here's another question and a thought that goes with it. You mentioned uh, um, about approximately one third of premature deaths happening as a result of nutrition issues. Uh, I think the number provided by, by WHO was somewhere in the region of 11 million people dying as a result of things going wrong in so far as nutrition is concerned. Now, obviously, um, there is also interplay between nutrition, lack of physical activity, lack of social connectedness, smoking, and so on and so forth. It, 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 are we thinking that if people were to correct their nutritional status, 
regardless of whether they are paying attention to other unhealthy lifestyles that we will actually be able to prevent those 11, 12 million deaths? I mean, I think it's a great comment and a question. So perhaps if you could sh you know, share your wisdom with us on that. Um, to me, I think things must go hand in hand, but maybe, maybe, but we want to hear from you, please. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's that is the key question. I think the estimates are like yes, independently, that might be the case. Yes, that independently, nutrition is a big enough risk factor. But I agree with you. I think when we are talking about population health, I don't think we can ignore anything, and that's the whole point of you know when we think about nutrition research, we can't just ignore foods for a single nutrient. We can't you and that was my disclaimer around mm -hmm. vitamin D that it's not a magic bullet. I'm mm -hmm. not going to recommend that. Okay, everyone just go take mega doses of vitamin D and uh, that will make everyone healthy. Yeah, um, that's that's not the case here. I think things go hand in hand. I think we need to focus on a healthier lifestyle and a healthier future. And I think our focus cannot be, okay, we'll only go focus on, I mean, that's a whole point of precision nutrition. We need right. to actually focus on what the ecosystem a person is living in. Yeah. And just telling everyone that, okay, go consume this diet when they may not be able to afford it or access Correct. it or do anything. It means a Mediterranean diet everywhere is not going to be feasible, for example, right? So it's, it's, it's an ecosystem. So how can we work together? I'm a big champion of interdisciplinary and team science and team implementation and not you know this silo that okay there is the ministry of nutrition and ministry of reproductive rights and ministry of health and so on and so forth they have to work together there has to be some cohesion and i i'm in total agreement i'm a i'm a um i'm a, a practical guy <laughs> with little background in nutrition public health internal medicine but i think you're hitting the nail on the head and if i may share my thought and ask you a question uh, which is, and I think you made an invaluable point where you said one size, um, it's not as a one size fits all approach. And we do that in clinical practice, patient centered approach, everyone is different. Um, two people may have the same diagnosis and yet the approaches with, that we may offer them may be totally different. And so obviously the needs are societal and society and culture specific needs. And I'm thinking of some low-income nations, Dr. Mehta, where you have expertise, you've done so much work in those nations. Obviously, let's say if rice or wheat is staple diet in a poor country, and they can only go so far in buying and spending money, uh, clearly some of the work that you are doing on developing apps and so on and so forth will be helpful to those populations. Let's deal with what you have. We will help you find resources in, in what you have in your community. I take it that would be wonderful. Um, perhaps providing some guidance, changing their perceptions and the way they're thinking, help them identify resources that are available to them in their local markets, right? I would assume that that's where your app could be helpful uh, to such populations. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that's that's a concept we have submitted, but uh, the first round got rejected. We'll see if we get funding for it. But the idea is the same thing that, okay, when we talk about precision nutrition, we can identify who is at risk. And then can we now go the next level where basically say, for example, uh, the one idea that I really, really, really uh, what, will come out of the nutrition or precision health study also when we phenotype these 10,000 people is effectively what we are making is the digital twin for everyone, right? So we are making like, okay, if, uh, so if we could do that, say in a setting like Qatar, or we could do that in India or something like that, that we had a representative population, we had phenotyped them. And now let's take an example of anemia. We know that, okay, in these people with these characteristics, iron supplements work. In these people, iron injections or IV iron works. In these people, there are other ways that we can improve iron and it's not as urgent. And now a patient comes into, or a child comes into the <laughs> clinic and with my smartphone computer, it could be a community health, you know, and everyone has a, uh, it could be a community health center. Everyone has a phone. You, you enter the criteria of this child and your phone tells you that this child's characteristics match with this or we can make a digital twin. So this person is most likely going to respond to this. So why does this person need to go through the clinical cascade of, oh, this is the first thing we'll try, then this is the second thing, while that per person is suffering for six months, right? So th that's one level. 
But now if you're going to do food based or diet based lifestyle modification, can we expand that to the next level? Yeah. So this is the neighborhood that this child lives in. These are the resources that this child has. <clears throat> These are their cultural and dietary preferences. Now we have the API or the connection to the grocery store that is close where this kid shops. Can we do the, give them a customized can we give them a customized diet plan based on what they can afford, what they prefer, and what they can access? Right. So that will be, I think, the position that Christian faced too. But you know, it's a little pie in the sky right now, but I think we have the tools and technologies to get there. So I uh, there's a question, and I, I think I want to maybe um, um, uh, change that question to include my thoughts as well. I am um, not um, a great scientist, uh, Dr. Mehta, as you are. Uh, and as I said, I'm a practical guy. I, um, we are aware of randomized control trials. We are aware of uh, the issues surrounding internal validity of these trials. But I'm also aware that uh, it's, it, while we call them golden, they offer golden standards and what have you, that there are also problems and challenges with RCT and depending on, uh, on the results that they generate, uh, I am referring to external validity as it is called. Um, obviously, RCTs are based on subjects, inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, um, efficacy benefits seen in experimental conditions as opposed to benefits seen in the community at large. Um, and 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 I'm I'm thinking of real world data. I'm I'm I, I I'd love to go beyond that. I'm reminded of the Blue Zones project, and needless to say, you are aware of it. Um, it. It is my hope and hope of other people I talk to that one day all these gadgets that we are generating will will be helpful to the community at large, taking into account some of the other variables that have been ignored. To a large extent, and uh, and again, with your wisdom and your expertise, perhaps these apps and what have you will incorporate some of these things and challenges. Any comments on that, Dr. Mehta? Please. Right, and I think uh, I agree, and I think it's an ecosystem. So it, this is just one piece of the puzzle, and you yes. know, like I didn't talk about some of our work with randomized controlled trials, or you know, some of the biofortification work where we have done some yes. of the primary uh, RCTs in that, uh, but. The whole idea of biofortification, for example, was for targeted towards poorest of the poor. Like what you yeah. started with the, you know, a couple of thoughts ago around is people have rice, people have wheat. How do we make wheat and rice healthier? Yeah. Right. And not just focus on um, um, the downs, uh, not just focus on, okay, eliminate wheat and rice as a population recognition. That's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. So how do we make it healthier? How do we diversify that? So that's, that's basically, um, why biofortification was kind of born. And um, so we have done trials with that where we have, you know, uh, violated all principles of clinical trials, I have to admit. <laughs> so all my AP training, because we uh, we did this trial in Mumbai, in urban slums of Mumbai, where we included all children unless they were like, you know, severely sick or needed to be hospitalized or something. Because the idea was that we want to show evidence that the India's midday meal program or India's ICDS scheme can actually adopt and not say that this was only designed for sick children or people, you only targeted a subset of people who were most likely to benefit. We want to show the benefit across the range. So it was kind of a quasi efficacy, quasi effectiveness kind of a study where we were like, okay, we'll recruit, we'll take 90% of the kids and then see whether this makes a difference or not. And uh, so that, that was the idea in there where we did see some effects on hemoglobin and so on, because we wanted to argue that this can be instead of subsidizing wheat and rice through your PDS or through the public distribution system or the integrated child development scheme, you can actually replace at least a small percentage of that with say by 45 minutes or things like that. It doesn't need to be the whole replacement, but maybe yeah. plug and play 10 or 20%. So that that's the idea, but it's an ecosystem. So same thing, the, some of the work that I presented with Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, the idea is how do we identify those barriers? How do we help countries scale up? How do we help them identify what's the right variety for their climate and so on and so forth? Because yeah. it has to be customized. We can't just go out and say that everyone yeah. take biofortified crops and sure, all yeah. the problems are solved. Yeah. Did I hear you say ICDS centers in India? Yes. So we, you and I need to have a telephone conversation. 
because okay. I was involved in it at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences going back several years ago. I won't tell you how long ago, but you and I can have a chat on that. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> so there are a couple of more questions. I hope we are not running you late because obviously there's a lot of interest in what you have said. It, this may not be pertinent, but we, we, we would love to seek your guidance and, uh, and wisdom on nutrition supplements from a general standpoint. Any thoughts on that? Uh, are they good? Are they bad? <laughs> if so, what should public uh, pay attention to and so on and so forth? Any generic yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> so again, <laughs> I, I think, you know, I think one should be careful about some supplements. I think, uh, yeah. yeah, in general, I think we should be able to identify what gaps we have in our diets. And sometimes supplements are really, really useful in that context. Yeah. But um, especially in the US, because it's sometimes very unregulated. So some supplements are not necessarily, um, one, one needs to, you know, be a little bit cautious in embracing all kinds of supplements. But yes, an informed approach to what kind of supplements you might need, because, you know, we have seasonal diets, we have seasonal deficits in our diets and so on. For example, I can't get any vitamin D naturally right now. So, um, so uh, in the climate yeah. that I live in. So that, that's, that's, you know, it has to be tailored. If um, there's another remark here, if we were to focus on the ecosystem and you spoke um, very intelligently and the relationship and so on and so forth, how does one... Um, make the programs or, or apps that people are developing inclusive of uh, things that people may suffer from, for example, lactose intolerance and so on and so forth. I would imagine there would be something in them to provide spe specific guidance to such people with such issues. Uh, yeah, I, I think if the study is large enough, I mean, that's a really good question and a really interest, important point because yeah. often people are ignored and marginalized because, you know, of certain things and allergies and whatnot. So um, so in a large enough study like the Nutritional Precision Health Study, again, the idea was the whole consortia really kept the exclusion criteria to a minimum because if the guidance is supposed to apply to people in real life and say 40 to 60 percent of people have chronic disease or some kind of allergies or some kind of other things it has to apply to them so unless something could have become a constitute a medical emergency largely speaking the consortia try to limit the number of things that will exclude people so we do want to include everyone in there as much as we can right there's a, a question and a comment. I think I'm trying to see if I can. Uh, I think it's talking about the uh, the rapid diagnostic tests and the approval by agencies such as FDA and so on and so forth. I guess uh, that probably is a process that one has to go through in order to get approval. Uh, so, so I will just say briefly that, yes, that uh, there are companies that are trying to do that, but then I'm not going to speak to that because that's on the corporate side. So I'm going to only sure. stick to my academic sure. Uh, sure. hat here. <laughs> Understandable. Well, you, you've you been absolutely, I'm, I'm sorry we've kept you for a few minutes extra, but you've been absolutely wonderful. And uh, um, um, I can't thank you enough. Uh, on behalf of Wild Cornell, um, we are a family, of course, you are Cornell, we are Cornell. <laughs> and on behalf of the Institute for Population Health, uh, I want to express our gratitude to you. Uh,